it is 9 a.m. So we will begin our proceedings as people are entering. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the New York State Public Input Webinar on the topic of home energy rebates and clean energy workforce training grants funded through the Federal Inflation Reduction Act. My name is Trevor Reddick, the facilitator for today's event from Kearns and West. As we are filing in, we ask that you please rename yourself with your full name to help us as we sort our queue of public comments that will be provided later this morning. It is our pleasure to provide this information to you in a variety of formats to make it as accessible as possible, and we'll consider doing so in as many ways as we can. To start with, it is important for us to make you aware that this is being presented with simultaneous interpretation in the languages of Mandarin Chinese, Russian, Spanish, and Yiddish. For those who have joined, you have automatically been assigned to the English speaking channel. You can click the globe in the bottom left hand corner of your screen to identify the appropriate language channel that you would like to join. We greatly appreciate the opportunity to provide this along with American Sign Language interpretation throughout this event. A couple of items to start with in terms of housekeeping here for the meeting. First, the chat function should exclusively be used for technical issues and concerns only. Morgan Nachman from the Kearns and West team is here to provide that service. Please send them a chat directly and please avoid using the chat for any other considerations. If you have any comments related to the content of this discussion and or you have any questions that you would like answered by the NYSERDA team, please use the Q&A function in the bottom right hand of your screen next to the chat where you will be able to provide written comments or questions that will be reviewed by NYSERDA. A reminder that all information received from participants, whether in this event or through prior events or through written comment provided through forums like the residential IRA email account will be incorporated into NYSERDA's published summary response and the approach taken to program design and updates. A reminder that comments should be submitted by 1220 to ensure time for incorporation into a report expected in early 2024. Once again, chat for technical issues to Morgan Nachman. Any Q&A related to comments or questions on content, please use the Q&A function. They will be reviewed and we greatly appreciate your input. To briefly cover with you our agenda this morning, we intend to cover a broad section of the Inflation Reduction Act and federally funded opportunities explicitly around housing funded decarbonization and contractor training funding to help to support those home energy rebate programs. Suzanne DeRoche will be providing an overview of the Inflation Reduction Act pieces and Courtney Moriarta will be providing details on the IRA home energy rebate programs, the grants and how these funds will be applied to make sure that they are accessible to New York households. We will then walk through a section on what's next, taking a peek around the corner to understand what our options and opportunities are as this process advances. And then the last hour of this event will be housed for participant comments where we will be taking spoken comments in addition to those written comments noted before. I'm Trevor Reddick from Kearns and West, the facilitator for this event. And as I just briefly noted, we are joined by Suzanne DeRoche, Vice President of the Clean and Resilient Buildings Program at NYSERDA, and Courtney Moriarta, Director of Single Family Residential Programs. I will now pass it along to Suzanne, who will provide us some information on the IRA background and overview. Take it away, Suzanne. Thank you, Trevor. Next slide. Good morning, everyone. I'm Suzanne DeRoche, Vice President for Clean and Resilient Buildings here at NYSERDA. I'm really pleased that we have so much interest in this talk topic. Over a thousand people signed up today for this session. We're excited to hear from you about these important federal funding programs. The Biden administration and Congress have passed historic climate 
action legislation through the bipartisan infrastructure law, CHIPS, the Science Act, and the Science Act, and the Inflation Reduction Act, or otherwise known as IRA, that we're going to talk about today. These actions will deliver important benefits to New York households, and they'll accelerate the progress towards New York's climate and equity goals. Next slide. Today, we're going to specifically talk about the Inflation Reduction Act, IRA. The funding from IRA will provide a number of benefits, as you can see here. Those include um, that these funds are additional to and not a replacement for state or utility ratepayer investments. They will, will allow NYSERDA to serve customers statewide, including those areas, for instance, Long Island, customers of municipal electric utilities and others who are currently unable to access our programs funded by the current funding stream called the systems benefit charge. That's an important aspect of the IRA funds. So we'll be able to serve more people across the state. It encourages co uh, coordination of funding with existing state agency and utility programs to ensure the funding is accessible to all households and contractors and will support a range of initiatives and robust home improvements. It will also facilitate formal and informal partnerships specific to this funding with market and government partners with aligned interests and goals. In addition to these benefits, there are also some challenges that we'll need to navigate. We need to carefully review and be in compliance with federal rules and guidance that are necessary to allow leveraging of federal funds while streamlining homeowners journey through these upgrades. Certain rules and requirements will complicate our ability to integrate funding with certain existing programs, and we'll be working through that. Um, and are interested in your feedback on these topics today. I will now turn it over to my colleague, Courtney Moriarta, who will walk us through the specifics of these federal funding programs. Courtney? Yeah, thanks, Suzanne. I think you can go to the next slide, please. So, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, we have a lot of material to cover regarding these two programs uh, that are related to residential rebates under the IRA legislation that Suzanne discussed. Um, so I'm going to dive right in. Uh, so first and foremost, what are the home energy rebate programs? Uh, so the Inflation Reduction Act allowed for two individual provisions that describe two individual programs uh, that are providing funding to the state energy offices through formula grants to allow us to provide rebates to homeowners um, and building owners in the residential space to uh, promote both energy efficiency upgrades and also electrification upgrades to homes to help us advance our clean energy goals. So there's two sections to this. The first one is 50121. Um, this is called the Home Energy Performance Based Whole House Rebates in the IRA legislation and has been um, named by DOE. The official name of the program is the Home Efficiency Rebates. So these are the performance based rebates part of the programming. And then section 50122 is the high efficiency electric home rebate program as listed in the IRA legislation. And DOE is calling this the home electrification and appliance rebates or the HERE program. So we have the HER program, which is performance based, and the HERE program, which is aimed at electrification and is prescriptive and, and allows for prescriptive um, rebates for individual measures to be done to the home. So together we call these the home energy rebate programs. And through that formula grant, New York State will be receiving a total of $317.7 million to operate both programs uh, for a period lasting through September 30th, 2031. The two programs, the funding streams for both programs is split roughly equally. The HER program is receiving $159.3 million, and the HERE program is receiving $158.4 million. Go to the next slide, please. So, with the guidance that DOE issued to the states uh, this past July, they established some overarching outcomes that they're looking for the states to achieve in their program designs. Uh, and they're allowing the states some flexibility 
to take different approaches to meet these goals, but essentially. Uh, our objectives are to try to drive towards these overarching outcomes. So the first is to establish a well-established exemplary and innovative efficiency and electrification set of programs. The second is to enable widespread access and uptake for disadvantaged communities and to lower the energy burden for low-income households. Additionally, we want to establish some proven value streams um, for sustained investments to continue the path towards market transformation and our clean energy goals. And then last but not least, we're looking to reduce the pollution from buildings to support our climate action and improve public health. Next slide. So which homes qualify for these programs? Rebates are available to households of any income uh, between the two programs. Single family homes and multifamily buildings are both eligible for these two programs. The rebates are available to individual homeowners, building owners, and aggregators in the market that will be carrying out energy efficiency upgrades, both of single family homes and of multifamily buildings. New construction projects are not eligible and the states have the ability to choose to restrict the program eligibility to narrow the set of the households based on our kind of existing conditions, existing programming that we have in the state um, or our, our objectives for our energy goals. Next slide. So this slide shows you a summary of what the HER program has to offer. And again, this is the, the performance-based rebate program and this program is aimed at energy efficiency, improving the energy efficiency of both individual homes and multifamily buildings. Um, and there's two different paths that are allowed. One is called the modeled energy savings path, and the other is the measured energy savings path. And the difference there is that under the modeled energy savings path, um, the contractor that serves the building would provide an energy analysis of the building up front and predict the energy savings based on the package of measures that they want to install in the home. Um, and then the rebate amount would be based on the predicted level of energy savings um, that was generated by this model. The measured savings approach is a little bit different where uh, they would the, the practitioner would still predict the energy savings up front, but they would not be paid for the incentives until after a measurement period where they're actually monitoring and measuring the energy savings at the meter, at the gas or electric meter um, for the home. So in, the, in that case, under the measured approach, an, an aggregator or a contractor would offer the rebate to the homeowner upfront, and then they would assume um, the risk for being able to collect the money at the end of the measurement period. Um, so it's a little bit different implementation model. The levels of incentives vary. Uh, they start at about $2,000 per home, uh, and that would be for achievement of 20% energy savings in the home, up to 34%. And for income levels that are greater than 80% of area median income, we could cover up to 50% of the total project cost. There's a cap at 50% of total project cost. For the low income segment, which is defined by DOE as less than 80% of area median income, we can provide it, uh, incentives up to 80% of the total project cost. Um, and also for that low income segment, the, the incentives are doubled. So for, under the modeled energy savings, you can receive $2,000 per home for 20% energy savings. You can receive $4,000 per home for 35% energy savings. Um, and then for low income, those values are doubled. Under the measured savings, there's a calculation that would take place that's based on the actual measured energy savings at the end of the measurement period, which would be approximately a year after, uh, after the measures were installed. And that rate is $2,000 for every 20% reduction of energy use um, based on the average for the home in the state. And then last but not least, multifamily buildings, as I mentioned, are eligible for these programs. And in order to qualify for the low income uh, levels of incentives, 
they would need to have at least 50% of the occupants meet eligibility requirements uh, for those income levels. Next slide. So now we'll talk about the here rebates. So again, these are the electrification and appliance rebates that are aimed at promoting building beneficial electrification for buildings. So the law specifies that here would be available to both low and moderate income households. And in this case, DOE has defined and the legislation itself defines low and moderate income as being less than 150% of area median income. Individuals and entities with multifamily buildings, um, same as for the HER program, would be eligible for those low and moderate income um, incentives based on buildings that have at least 50% of the occupants that would qualify under those income eligibility requirements. Additionally, government, commercial, and nonprofit entities that are implementing projects on behalf of lower and moderate income households are also eligible to receive these these incentives for their buildings. Under here, we can cover up to 100% of the total project cost for qualified electrification projects. Um, and that would be for homes that are in the lowest income category, which is the 80% or less of area median income. States may decide if new construction projects are eligible under this. So that'll be a consideration for us to take into account in our program design. Um, we may also, again, choose to restrict the program eligibility to a narrower set of households or market segments based on existing conditions and program offers. Next slide. So this is what the HERE rebates look like. And as I mentioned, these are prescriptive. So this is the, the complete list of the measures that are eligible for these rebates. And these are the rebate amounts that are prescribed by the legislation. So this is in the law, uh, these rebate levels. So for a heat pump water heater, you can get $1,750 towards the cost of the heat pump water heater. And then you can see uh, based on the income level, those levels are capped again, based on a percent of the total project cost. So if you're below 80% of AMI, you could get up to 100% of the total project cost covered, and if you are between 80 and 150% of AMI, you can get up to 50% of the total project cost. And the total cap, you can, you can accumulate these um, incentives and do packages of improvements, um, but the maximum allowable per home is $14,000. Uh, again, same requirements for the income eligibility for multifamily buildings, at least 50% of the occupants need to meet the eligibility criteria. Um, this also comes with an additional installer incentive of up to $500, which the law says needs to be commensurate with the scale of the upgrades that are installed. And DOE has in fact provided us with a schedule of what those, what those levels are um, for each one of these measures that are listed above. So every individual project will not receive $500 under that installer incentive. It'll be based on the actual measures that are installed in the schedule that DOE has provided to us. And then last but not least, the, the law also prescribes for under this program that all appliances, systems, equipment, infrastructure, and components must be Energy Star certified if it is applicable to that particular technology um, or piece of equipment. Um, so we will be looking uh, you know, to define our program our program rules around that and make sure that we're getting Energy Star equipment installed in these homes. Next slide. So just a couple of notes on multifamily. As I noted, uh, uh, for both programs, in order for a multifamily building to qualify for low income or moderate income levels of incentives, you need at least 50% of the occupants to meet those eligibility criteria. Um, in addition, DOE has prescribed to the state some minimum levels of spending of the rebate money that they expect the, the states to spend, uh, both on multifamily and on low income. Um, so they are requiring us to um, allocate a minimum of 10% of our total rebate allocation uh, toward multifamily and also, to, or sorry, towards multifamily low income. Um, 
We also have a minimum allocation towards low income, uh, which would be the 80% and less of area median income, uh, which is based on our, our population statistics. And in our case, that would be 40% of the total remit amount would be allocated to low income across the board. Um, the other distinction with DOE uh, versus the way that our programs currently run is that uh, US DOE is defining multifamily as any building that has two or more dwelling units, which is a little bit different from our existing programs, which currently define multifamily as buildings that have five or more dwelling units. So that'll be um, a specification that we're going to have to reconcile when we introduce these rebates into our programs. Additionally, DOE has provided us with a list of federal programs uh, that are approved for what we're calling categorical low and moderate income eligibility screening. And what that means is if a, uh, a homeowner or a occupant of a multifamily building currently is a recipient of any of these um, assistance programs that the federal government provides, we can automatically qualify them for the low income uh, part of the, the level of incentive. Um, and then just to know on the multifamily side, we have identified this as a potential um, challenge for us and the Energy Star requirements might limit us in some ways uh, because some of the technologies and equipment that we need in multifamily buildings may not have Energy Star equipment available. So that's something we'll be working with DOE on as well. Next slide. And we wanted to let you know also there's one more provision in the law, which comes right after the two programs, which is section 50123. Um, and this is an additional formula grant that's available to states to help provide support for workforce development and training for contractors that are providing services in the two programs that I just talked about. Uh, so. There's $200 million available total to all states, and New York's allocation of that is $6.4 million. Uh, we are work currently working on an application to get access to those funds. The due date is in January of 2024. Um, and the provisions in the law are asking that, that state programs that are applying for this funding are aimed at reducing the cost of training uh, for contractor employees to provide testing and certification for contractors who are trained and educated under a state program. And also we can partner with nonprofit organizations to help develop and implement a state training program. Uh, since NYSERDA already has a workforce development set of initiatives and programs, we'll be looking for ways that we can utilize this money to uh, add to the existing workforce development programs that we have at NYSERDA and really provide the support that's needed for the contractor base that will need to deliver the services for the HERE and HER programs explicitly. Uh, we can go to the next slide. So how will we be ensuring that our home energy rebates and training opportunities reach New York State households? Uh, we'll go to the next slide. So these are some of the key implementation objectives that we've developed as we're starting to think about how we uh, you know, approach the problem of developing a program plan for these uh, two programs. So st starting with <clears throat> that we really want to leverage our existing programs that will help to accelerate and simplify the delivery of these, these new rebates into the market. So since NYSERDA already has some existing programs that are fairly robust and we have existing infrastructure in place to support those programs, we're really looking for ways that we can just layer the federal funding into our existing programs to expand the reach and to, to deepen uh, the level of incentives that are available to homeowners. The next uh, sort of overarching objective is the idea that we really want to minimize any market confusion by avoiding having competing offers in the market. So again, we'll be looking to, wherever possible, layer these incentives onto existing programs rather than create an entirely new programs and, and workflows in the market. We want to create a seamless experience, both for our customers and for our contractors. Again, kind of looking to remove as much friction as possible from the transaction of implementing these 
measures in homes and getting these rebates to our homeowners uh, and building owners and, um, you know, make it as efficient a process as possible. We want to provide clear and concise information on all available offers. And I'll just say that it's going to be a challenge to us because with the stacking of the incentives that's available to us, where we can combine federal money with existing state and ratepayer money, uh, it'll be a little bit complicated um, on a case by case basis, but we are working to create tools that will help support our contractors um, in being able to deliver the best possible offers to their customers and also uh, to make sure that the information is very clear. Uh, to the homeowners so they understand what's available to them. We want to leverage some of our existing resources, such as our residential energy audit program to enable customized and decision quality recommendations uh, to be available to consumers and help them make uh, informed decisions and maximize the impact of this money. And then last but not least, we do want to ensure equitable, dis equitable distribution of funding across the single family, the small multi-unit residents and larger multifamily building sectors of our building stock. Next slide. So how will we maximize the rebate impact? So I talked that we can, we can stack these incentives or some people refer to it as braiding the funding. Um, we are looking at ways that we can be as effective as possible in doing this and make sure that the money goes to places where it can be the most effective. So stacking of the home energy rebates with non federal funds, like NYSERDA's as existing programs is generally allowable and it is also encouraged by DOE. As Suzanne mentioned, this money is meant to be additive to our existing programs. Um, and the only restriction on that, of course, is that we would not rebate people more money than what the total project cost is. So if we capped at the total project cost, we are allowed to stack per and here incentives at the project level. The only restriction there is we cannot combine them for an individual measure. So for instance, if someone installs insulation in their home and receives a here incentive, then they cannot also receive a her incentive for that same insulation work. Another important thing to note is, as I mentioned, NYSERDA already manages um, a few different programs that provide services in these areas. And part of what we're doing behind the scenes is also managing multiple funding sources. And that is particularly important for our Empower Plus program, which serves single family, low and moderate income customers. Uh, so we already have systems in place that allow us to help identify the best possible uh, kind of braiding of funds for every individual homeowner that participates in our program. So we will continue to leverage and utilize those resources that we already have in play to be able to sort of fold the federal money into our existing programming in a way that can be as seamless as possible and really provide the best information possible to contractors and the customers as they're planning out their energy improvement pro uh, projects. DOE is also working on developing additional guidance materials for states to help us understand the best methods for grading of the funds, and there will be more information available at a later time. Next slide. So I spoke about this a little bit on an earlier slide, but our funding allocations for low income households um, are based on the, the population uh, demographics in New York State. So in New York State, we are required to uh, provide at least 41% of, of the rebate money to low income households, which would be $104.2 million in rebate money. And of course, to meet our Climate Act goals, we will continue to, uh, to strive to achieve the goal of making sure that we invest at least 35% of the funds with a goal of 40% in disadvantaged communities that are aligned with both the New York State Climate Act and the Federal Justice 40 criteria. And as I mentioned earlier, there's also a minimum allocation required that at least 10% of the rebate money is allocated towards multifamily low-income buildings. Next slide.
On the workforce development side, as I mentioned, there's a 6.4 million dollar grant available to New York State to help fund additional workforce development and training activities. Uh, so we are looking for leveraging that money to allow us to subsidize certifications and additional training for energy auditors, home performance contractors, and HVAC contractors, and potentially other trades um, that may be necessary to carry out some of the work for electrification. So in particular, electricians and potentially plumbers as well. Um, we would we would be looking to offer higher incentives for individuals who are either residents of disadvantaged communities or businesses that are in dis disadvantaged communities and also continuing to target NYSERDA's priority population uh, criteria. And that includes employees of minority owned women owned service disabled veterans and veteran owned businesses. So these activities will provide career pathways for new and existing workers and we aim to promote diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility in all of our workforce programs. Next slide. So we wanted to talk just a little bit about the disadvantaged communities and federal justice 40 alignment. So New York State has recently uh, established a definition and a criteria for what qualifies as a disadvantaged community for New York State under our Climate Act. And meanwhile, the federal government has their own definition for uh, their Justice 40 alignment. So what we've done here is begun to map out what those what those geographic areas look like to give us an understanding of what that means for New York State and where there's overlap. Um, so we can begin to understand how we can layer these incentives in a way that is as seamless as possible for the market. And this is a work in progress for us to understand the best approach for making sure that these offers are available and that we really optimize and maximize the benefits to disadvantaged communities statewide. Uh, but what you see here is the purple areas are the areas that uh, fall under our current definition of disadvantaged communities based on our Climate Act in New York State. And the green shaded areas are showing the federal justice 40 areas. And you can see that there's a lot of overlap, but there's also some sections uh, that are different. So we're working with DOE right now uh, to better understand how we can best implement these rebate programs in such a way that we're complying with the federal rules, uh, but also providing the, the maximum benefit possible to all disadvantaged communities. And one of the reasons that we want to do that is not only to reach our 40% of benefits goals that we have under our Climate Act, uh, but also the, the HER program, the performance-based program, allows for an additional incentive to contractors of $200 per project if they complete projects within a disadvantaged community. So we're still working on what that definition looks like when we overlay the justice 40 with the New York State disadvantaged communities definition. And we'll be looking for stakeholder input on that as well. Next slide. Okay, so what's ahead with just a couple more slides here and we'll be able to get to the public comment section of, of the program. Um, we, uh, you can go ahead to the next slide. What we wanted to do here is just give you a little bit of a view of what's in store, what NYSERDA has to do to make this money available, to get access to this money for New York State, and then to make it available into the market, um, and then a little bit on what we think our anticipated timelines look like. So what you see here is a list of all of the plan elements that NYSERDA is required to develop and submit to the Department of Energy in our application for this funding. Um, and you can see it's it's a long list. Uh, it's going to be a fairly complicated and comprehensive set of um, applications and implementation plans that we need to submit in order to get access to the full um, portfolio of funding. Um, so we're asking that folks bear with us as we go through this process uh, and develop out these plans and get our applications submitted to DOE. Um, you can see a couple of things that I would like to highlight in here of what's included in this implementation blueprint that DOE is asking for. Um, 
It includes a community benefits plan, which will be kind of its own standalone plan and will leverage some of NYSERDA's existing programs um, around community benefits to help support that. Um, there's a requirement that we deliver a market transformation plan. That will be something that comes out after a few months after we introduce the programs into the market. Uh, but there is a, a, an overriding objective here that these rebates are not kind of just one and done in the market, but that we're actually trying to leverage them in a way that they're sustaining uh, impact on the market, even after the money is no longer available. So we'll be thinking about how we do that and what does the market transformation plan look like. Um, we'll go to the next slide. Okay, so this is a rough timeline. Uh, this is our best guess at this point. Um, I know it's been a while since the legislation came out in August of 2022, but there are steps that had to be taken um, and things that needed to happen before we could actually get to the point where we're at, where we're able to actually write a plan. Um, back in July uh, of this, this year, we received the guidance from DOE on what we're expected to provide uh, in our applications. In October, NYSERDA received some early admin funds and what that gave us was a little bit of money to allow us to begin to, um, you know, hire consultants and implementation contractors to help us begin to develop this plan and work on any of the kind of market character characterization uh, work that we needed to do or any analysis. So. Now we have that ability to do that work and have the money to help support it. And so now we are very heavily engaged in trying to uh, work through this process of figuring out what's actually going into our implementation plan and how these rebates are ultimately going to overlay with our existing programming in the state. Um, we are actively in conversations with DOE right now, um, pursuing an accelerated application. Uh, that we're looking to hopefully get in before the end of the year. Uh, and in, if we are successful in that endeavor, that would be an application for uh, kind of a, a partial rollout of some of, of the rebates in a way that we think would be as, as quick and easy as possible with a phased in plan for how we might uh, roll out the complete set of programs later in the year. So that's our current strategy is to try to get this accelerated application into DME as quickly as possible to allow us to get some money into the market uh, as early in 2024 as possible, and then to have a phased rollout plan to develop the rest of the programming uh, for introduction later in the year. We will continue with stakeholder engagement through this process. We have multiple work groups that are being that are either already established or being established. Um, to help provide individual opportunities for individual interest groups to have conversations with NYSERDA as we go through this process. And we do anticipate there will be additional public meetings um, to provide updates as we move through this process. Next slide. So, we're moving now into the section where you get to talk to us um, and tell us what your thoughts are. Um, we really do value your input. Um, we have already hold, held some initial stakeholder sessions uh, this past fall. We met with our residential market advisory group um, and that group, if, if you're not already a member of that group, that is open to anyone who wants to participate that is engaged in the residential sector at all in New York State. Um, you can uh, uh, sign up for our email list and participate in that group. Uh, we also have established a working group of community stakeholders and a working group of participating contractors. And there will be additional work groups established, as you can see at the bottom of this slide, around utilities, multifamily uh, contractors and our outreach partners, retailers and product manufacturers and others as needed as we go through the process and identify what some of those other interest groups might be. Um, as Suzanne mentioned, we had over a thousand registrants for today's webinar uh, and over 150 questions or comments were submitted in the pre 
uh, registration materials. So we'll be working through those over the next several weeks uh, to make sure that we can address the public comments uh, as best as possible and make sure that they're helping to inform our program design. Um, so how do you sign up? You could send your written comments to residential.ira at nyserta.ny.gov. If you send them before December 20th, uh, we will make sure that we get them incorporated into a summarized response um, to the public comments that we've received to date. Uh, you can certainly send them after December 20th. Uh, that's just a deadline to make sure that we can kind of have a cutoff for when we establish uh, digging into the creating a response that we can provide to the public. So we will publish a comprehensive summary and responses to our stakeholder input um, at a later time. Um, and now we look forward to collecting your public comments for folks who signed up to make verbal comments. And I think with that, I'll pass this back over to Trevor and he's going to facilitate that process. Yes, excellent. Thank you so much, Courtney. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for all of the interest. We greatly appreciate the opportunity to hear from you. First, a sincere thank you to all of those who expressed interest in participating today. In total, we had over 100 participants indicate interest in providing public comment at this time. Given the time constraints and the high volume of interest, we will work to accommodate as many spoken comments until 11 a.m. Eastern time here that we can. Given the, that volume, we're going to ask that everybody follow the following process in order to help us to be able to facilitate this as smoothly as possible. First, during this public comment section of the webinar, I, as the facilitator, will be announcing speakers in order of the queue. That queue is first come, first served, based on registration date and time. Once approved, the speaker will have up to two minutes to provide remarks. If your comments take less than two minutes, we kindly request that you consider yielding the balance of your time in order to allow for more participants to be able to join in the conversation. When you have seated the rest of your time or have completed your time limit, whichever comes first, I will thank you for your time and then announce the next speaker you will then be returned to the audience as a participant where you will not have audio or video permissions. For those that have registered and want to make your voice heard, we do sincerely thank you and look forward to receiving your feedback, whether that's here as spoken comment or as written comment submitted during or after the webinar to that residential.ira at nyserta.ny.gov email account. A reminder that comments can be submitted until Wednesday, December 20th, 2023, 4 p.m. Eastern. All stakeholder input will be considered by staff as part of the program development and update process. Again, we will seek to incorporate as many spoken comments here as we can. Noting the time constraints, we do greatly appreciate it and will attempt to move through this as smoothly as possible. With that noted, our first speaker, Dr. Zhang, if you may, please, the floor is yours. Hello, thank you so much for the information. Um, I think overall the program is very encouraging, but I do have uh, a few things and want to uh, Nasserta to put in consideration, con considering what we have done with a clean heat program for New York State as as whole. Uh, first concern we would have it will be, uh, do we have allocated funding towards a single family and uh, light commercial and uh, multifamily? As you mentioned, you want to allocate the fund equally among all those different applications. So, do we have a fixed allocation amount? per each sector. So that's going to be the first one because the residential load will be faster and uh, more massive and uh, multifamily will take a longer time in uh, many aspects of uh, from specs out the model and uh, carry out the 
action plan with all the multifamily related trades. So <clears throat> with that to be said, for New York City alone, there's a multiple style of multifamily. When you said five doings above, that including call ups and uh, condos, things like that. So we need a more clarifica uh, clarification for that. And second thing will be who will be the agency to carry out the rebates. Uh, for currently, New York State heavily relied on the utility company, although NYSERDA has a funding for different programs, but the rebates of each utility company is carried out by utility company. What's the game plan to allocate the fund and carry out into the marketplace without confusion in combining with IRA tax, tax credit and also utility funds? And so this is a, a big concern for a lot of people who went through New York City with the Con Edison territory and went through the whole pause, you know, and resume of the program. Although the program has been very effectively reestablished now, but we don't want to create a chaos at the beginning as well. So that's the second concern. And third one will be the payout of the rebates. Does Nesserta has a plan already, whether it's going to be going through contractor or it's going to be rebate directly to the customers. So either or there's a pros and cons and uh, I hope Nesserta can soon uh, have a guidelines for that because then contractor, whoever going to be participating has to factor the cash flow into their consideration and how much pressure of the cash flow they can take on as a small business owner. So m many of them are small business owner. So those are the ones that I, you know, I want to comment on and hopefully NYSERDA can uh, considering into the application with the DOE. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chang. Appreciate your input and perspective here. We'll now move on to our second speaker this morning, Catherine Casey, when you are ready. Hi, good morning. Um, thank you very much. That was well presented and um, a lot of information. I'm an executive director of a very small housing authority. My comment is this rooftop programs for single family residential property owners and large commercial ground mounted or rooftop solar gardens are well developed and funded. But disadvantaged communities access to community solar is virtually non existent and here's why. Current tariff rules don't permit or provide a mechanism for aggregating community generation from multiple buildings at scattered sites to be distributed equitably among individually metered resident subscribers at low moderate income rental locations, which in our area or market is almost exclusively low rise garden apartments. I'm all the way out east um, on Long Island. An appropriate solution would be for the tariff scheme to allow for the aggregation of the energy produced by arrays on multiple buildings at a single site under one ownership set up as a virtual community meter to be distributed equitably among resident subscribers, not unlike remote metering, but in the reverse. The solutions are tariff changes and a mechanism to facilitate community generated and community distributed solar for scattered site multifamily housing. Absent these disadvantaged communities do not have access to community shared solar. At low moderate income rental properties, each unit of housing is individually metered. Affordable rents take into consideration a utility schedule calculated annually for the local market at those utility expenses for which the tenant is responsible. They are subtracted from the maximum gross fair market rent to create a payment standard. Electric heat, air conditioning, domestic hot water supply, water cooking, trash collection and sewer are the most common. Electric generally the most expensive is almost always individually metered and the tenants financial responsibility. Master metering a multifamily rental property would increase energy consumption. The likelihood of energy conservation plummets when there's no financial consequence to the consumer. So the East Hampton Housing Authority has six properties, 189 units of housing and 80,000 square feet available for solar arrays that, according to our helioscope modeling, would have an output of 773 kilowatts 
producing almost one megawatt hour per year. Our new construction is all electric per HCR and East Hampton Town initiatives. The other four older properties are being decarbonized right now through NYSERDA Pond 3414, um, CDBG, and IPC gap funding. And we've started the process of applying for the, the IRA Climate Friendly Homes Fund. We've done the preliminary application. Mm -hmm. We are shovel ready and we are already well down a path to increase renewable production and eliminate fossil fuel consumption, but we lack the ability to aggregate production from multiple sites and distribute credit equitably to multiple metered accounts. Thank you very much for giving me the time. Thank you, Catherine, for the comments. Greatly appreciated and thank you for taking the opportunity to chat with us. Next, we will have Acacia Moriello. When you are ready, please. Um, I threw into the chat that I'd like to yield my time to another participant. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we'll move to Stephanie Bassett. Stephanie, when you are ready. Hi, thank you for this presentation. Uh, it does look like there is significant work to be done to deliver this funding to the marketplace in a clear and effective manner. So I look forward to um, staying in touch with NYSERDA's um, presentations and information to come on that. Um, my public comments are um, rooted in my work as an architect working in the single family high performance sector in New York. Um, I have experienced the decline in state funding for energy efficiency measures in single family new construction. My third is incentives for tier three projects, which are those reaching passive house certification, um, a significant area of my work, declined from $4,500 per single family tier three project in 2021 to $2,500 in 2022 and $0 now. What was uh, reasonably transformational for my projects in 2021 um, has become of no impact now. Will the IRA funding allow NYSERDA to restore these previous levels to the single family marketplace? Additionally, how is NYSERDA applying funding leverage to the largest scale new construction single family home builders whose share of the new construction market was more than 40% of the total new construction single family builds in 2022. Separately, I am noting that the incentives managed by utilities, which are a major flow through for IRA funding, have prioritized HVAC electrification retrofit work and offer little to nothing for envelope improvements. Envelope improvements are the hallmark of passive house design, which has demonstrated that prioritizing envelope energy efficiency is the most eco economical pathway to substantial reductions in energy consumption. And finally, um, following up on the um, comments about renewables in on Long Island, um, I'm reminded that electrification incentives need to be promoted hand in hand with support of renewables and utility infrastructure in order to meet the additional electrical requirements. And so I would like to see uh, in the coming months how NYSERDA is able to leverage um, funding and policy towards um, a whole systems improvement in renewables and utility infrastructure as well. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Greatly appreciate you taking the opportunity to provide those comments today. Next, we will have Michael McQuaid. Michael, when you are ready. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. That was a nice presentation, uh, a lot to take in. As a previous um, comment person, I'd like to stay a um, Above this, um, but anyways, a couple things. I would like to see the NYSERDA funding 
when it is available uh, to be broken out into like a zone. Um, I'm in northern. I'm in northern New York, northern, um, like up by Canada. And when I normally see these fundings come out, it's more downstate. Um, you show the map of Long Island. Um, that's the whole county I live in. Um, but anyhow, I'd like to see it broken down into zones or areas, um, like um, home community renewable grants are applied. The other thing is, is um, the last thing is to get the word out to contractors or companies um, is NYSERDA nice, going to work with uh, local planning offices or economic development um, departments with municipalities? Um, because there is a lot of small contractors or companies that would be able to do these and would unfortunately need assistance with the paperwork uh, involved in um, these grants and. Um, to pass it, pass it on to the homeowners. Um, and that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. Greatly appreciate the comments. Next, we'll have Emily. Emily, please, when you're ready. Hi, everyone. Thank you. I'm Emily Ng with UHAB, a community-based organization whose mission is to empower low to moderate income residents to take control of their housing and enhance communities through strong tenant associations and lasting affordable co-ops. UHAB works with families in owner-occupied multifamily housing, known as Housing Development Fund Corporation Cooperatives, or HDFC co-ops, as well as tenant associations, to build leadership, democratic participation, and community through cooperation. Most HDFCs are located in historically redlined neighborhoods, that saw significant disinvestment, which has led to inefficient building systems and deferred maintenance. Our climate resiliency team works directly with building owners to navigate cost saving and energy efficiency programs and incentive offerings. We are excited for the opportunities the Inflation Reduction Act will bring to our community and hope that these programs enable building owners to complete projects. Building owners in our community face barriers that make it challenging to utilize existing programs and complete projects. And this moment offers an opportunity to look more closely at the barriers faced by the lowest income New Yorkers, modify traditional residential programs to reach more multifamily buildings, and make sure they're not left behind in the move towards decarbonization. As NYSERDA undertakes implementation of the, the rebate and um, IRA programs, we urge the agency to consider the needs of low-income communities. Our recommend recommendations are based on decades of assisting low-income um, HDFC co-op boards, shareholders, and residents on cost-saving energy options and our strategies to ensure that these lowest-income New York residents are able to access these funds and programs. We urge NYSERDA to allocate 100% of available funding to low-income households. Here in New York City, one of the greatest challenges when it comes to decarbonization is energy burden. Buildings that use oil for space heating, for example, face exorbitantly high heating costs and struggle to pay for retrofits that would save them money in the long term. In addition, these households are often ineligible for utility incentive programs based on their fuel type and are left with fewer options to make decarbonization retrofits or stack incentives. Since many low-income families, including seniors on fixed incomes, have limited or no tax liability, they are unable to take advantage of the full extent of the tax incentives offered by the IRA. Allocating additional IRA funds to low-income households would open up a pathway for these buildings with older systems and high emissions to decarbonize and reduce their energy burden while helping the state meet its energy goals. If New York State and New York City energy goals are to be met, building owners have to start doing work as soon as possible. Knowing the IRA funded programs will not open immediately, we are concerned about building owners in our community who must comply with city energy codes based on 2024 energy conservation measures. We encourage NYSERDA to make retroactive incentives available to those who purchase equipment starting in 2024 to make sure that building owners are not disincentivized from carrying out projects if they have to wait to be eligible. There are that current- That is time, Emily. Uh, if you could wrap the comments up, please. Okay, thanks. 
Uh, there are currently many programs, uh, however, different rules and requirements for each and application processes. Uh, we see, for example, um, weatherization program has a stringent eligibility requirement that pose significant barriers to access and um, gives us some lessons. If households are to submit sensitive financial documentation, it's a serious challenge for multifamily buildings. We want to see categorical eligibility, which is already done in existing NYSERDA programs. Uh, we urge NYSERDA to apply attestation in order to speed up the application process and avoid barriers. Um, we urge NYSERDA to allocate considerable amount of funds to multifamily buildings um, that haven't been able to access these programs in the past. Um, after the incentive, uh, the IRA tax incentives were announced, we noticed our community saw the prices of equipment going up by the same amounts as incentives. We'd like to see NYSERDA require a pledge from participating contractors stating they will not raise rates for labor or equipment. And these regulations are in place so buildings cannot double dip or use multiple funding sources for the same measure, but contractors and manufacturers should not be able to double dip by taking incentives on measures for which they have raised prices. Um, the uh, the uh, aggregators- well, Significantly over time, uh, if you could please wrap up your comments so we can move on and make sure we have enough time for others to provide their comments as well, please. Thanks. Um, there should be a simple process for community-based organization aggregators to qualify or apply on behalf of households and building owners they serve. Um, our team has seen interest in electrification, um, but oil uh, heated buildings uh, have to replace systems with fossil fuel systems due to getting stuck due to lack of comprehensive funding. Um, over recent years, there's been more focus on soliciting feedback from members um, in disadvantaged communities and providing honoraria. We recommend that NYSERDA seek additional input and guidance from community-based organizations and building owners in the HDFC co-op community to talk about barriers that low-income multifamily building owners face. Thank you. Thank you. And a reminder to everybody that written comment is available and we will be seeking to make sure that we optimize the time here for spoken comments and any comments you have which are not capable of being heard today will be reviewed by the NYSERDA team and will be heard and we will ask you to provide any written comments in excess of the time that we're able to allocate to public comment this morning. Keeping things moving forward swimmingly, Kelly, it is now your time to shine when you are ready. Hi, Kelly Ziegler speaking on behalf of Con Edison this morning. Thank you for the presentation. A lot of work uh, going into these efforts and a lot of complexity to manage. So really appreciate the team's effort and the, the presentation and remarks today. Con Edison strongly supports NYSERDA's efforts to maximize New Yorkers' access to federal funding. We support NYSERDA's efforts to implement federal programs in ways that work alongside utility-sponsored programs. Our goals should be to limit complexity, market confusion, and the market distortions that could occur without appropriate controls, particularly where incentive stacking is being considered. Federal funds should be prioritized for low and moderate income New Yorkers and those who cannot currently access utility programs. We look forward to working with NYSERDA to make sure the implementation of federal programs and married with utility programs is a success for our customers and for New Yorkers as a whole. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kelly. Thank you for your comments. Mary Ann Rothman, you are next when you are ready. Uh, good morning, thank you for this very informative session. I'm the Executive Director of the Council of New York Cooperatives and Condominiums, which is a membership organization created in the 1970s to provide information, education, and advocacy to help cooperatives and condominiums understand their responsibilities and to recognize opportunities. We support the leadership efforts in, by New York City and New York State in promoting energy efficiency and electrification, but compliance costs are often high, particularly in New York City's buildings of 25,000 square feet and more that must comply with Local Law 97's rigorous carbon reduction requirements. In cooperatives and condominiums, it's the resident homeowners who bear the burden of these costs. The rebate funding you've described today could be a unique opportunity to help seniors 
and others with modest incomes who may live in cooperatives and condominiums in more affluent neighborhoods to bear their share of compliance costs. We urge NYSERDA to exercise every avenue possible to enable homeowners and cooperatives and condominiums to benefit from the IRA funding. Thank you. Thank you very much. We greatly appreciate your comments and you taking the time to chat with us this morning. We'll now move on. Madeline Saltzman. Hello, thanks so much for having me. Um, my name is Madeline Salzman. I'm representing Earth Advantage, a nonprofit focused on equitable housing decarbonization across the United States. Um, and my comments are focused on the importance of New York taking action to support a sustainable marketplace for home energy upgrades, and in particular using these IRA funds as a catalyst for policies and programs that align with that goal. Um, just to start out with some high level numbers here, uh, New York state has 7.4 million homes, um, which using some very back of the envelope math from DOE, that is a total cost of decarbonizing New York households at about $350 billion. Um, whereas these programs, of course, are providing about $315 million. Um, if New York were to attempt to equally distribute the money across every household in the state, each household would get $34. Um, if it only distributed the funds to all the poverty-based households in, the, in, in New York based off of New York's definition, um, that would be $250 per household. So um, that is really just to illustrate that there, it, this is a catalyst um, as a funding source, and that needs to unlock other funding sources that will reach those other households in need. It will be impossible to serve all of the need that is out there through these funds alone. Um, and so I really want uh, NYSERDA to be thinking about how the success of the program should not be assessed by simply the number of households it reaches, but to what degree it demonstrates a functional market pathway for decarbonizing New York housing through reaching the households that need this work the most. Um, this program should be focused on economic development for both the workers and household recipients of these programs. So um, some general thoughts around how these programs can help support the market, support good jobs that grow the workforce and overall. Um, the rebates should be a way to not leave people behind when NYSERDA and New York State are taking on broader efforts to support the home energy upgrades market. For example, coupling a home energy rebate implementation with efforts to build a sustainable market for home energy upgrades, including policies that build demand for these upgrades. So, for example, a policy that includes home energy information disclosure for all households um, could be coupled with these programs that then would allow these programs to deliver uh, compliant home energy information for the recipient household so that they meet that need through these programs. Um, that would help build uh, investment that is much broader than just what um, the federal government or NYSERDA are bringing to the table. Um, um, I also uh, think- We're a little bit over time, so if you could just uh, wrap it up for us, we'd really appreciate Thank you. Um, I'll just say uh, they should establish a financial council um, to bring financing to the table and set a wage minimum standard for the program so that workers are treated fairly and companies are not competing off of the backs of workers. And happy to chat more. Thanks. Thank you so much, Madeline. And a reminder, any additional comments that we're not able to cover in these spoken comments, we really would appreciate if you could take the time to submit those written comments. We want to hear your perspectives and we want to make sure that there's an opportunity to have yourself heard. Uh, we have a couple of people in the queue right now, a little backed up, but uh, Yosef, uh, please. Hey, good morning. I'm Joseph Haida, electrification commercialization leader with Train Technologies. As an HVAC equipment manufacturer, we're interested in ensuring we equip our distributors and contractors to succeed in all IRA participating states. Um, our, our comment and question basically is New York considering using national standardized rebate forms. This would aid all contractors, especially those that serve multi state areas and overall reduce program complexity. Um, that's all I wanted to say. So, uh, go army. I'd like to yield the remainder of my time. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Francois, please. Good morning. Uh, Francois Rebosser uh, with uh, A.O. Smith, manufacturer of uh, uh, water heaters and heat pump water heaters. I want to uh, compliment um, NYSERDA for this uh, webinar, which is excellent. My comments are relative to the here prescriptive rebates. Um, I believe that uh, those rebates have a high potential for success uh, because of certain elements of the program design. This is a statewide program. This is a multi-year program. It's a standard amount and it's a standard process. So I invite NYSERDA to work with the New York utilities to try to um, have similar program design for utility incentives, statewide, multi-year, standard process and standard amount. This is not the case today for heat pump water heaters and this um, uh, would increase the potential for success of uh, market transformation uh, by far. Uh, simplifying the work of uh, our uh, trade trade allies. Um, the other comment I have is that it is super important that the rebate eligi income eligibility be determined on the spot um, so that uh, our contractors and retailers can pass the incentive of immediately, instantly uh, to the consumers. Uh, remember, uh, eight, about 80% of uh, water heater replacements are done in same day emergency. Um, this will be very important. Uh, and to finish, I would say that uh, probably what could help um, is uh, designing a contractor app um, where both utility rebates, instant rebates and IRA uh, rebates uh, are available. Um, for the contractor to uh, uh, deter for, for the contractor to determine eligibility and help uh, pass on the incentive up front and uh, on, on their invoice to the consumer. This is it for my comments and I yield. Thank you. Thank you very much, Francois. Greatly appreciate you providing that comment. And next we will have Jason Masters. Hello, my name is Jason Masters and uh, I purchased the house in uh, March, 2023. Uh, and I understand that there are rebates from my utility provider, PSEG Long Island. When I contacted PSEG Long Island, they said that they have a, an, already have a rebate uh, of $6,000 per heat pump. I have four questions. In what way can, can the NYSERDA incentives be applied if the homeowner installs the, uh, the heat pump? but certifies the installation through the authority having jurisdiction. The second question is, does the heat pump rebate noted in the presentation coming through the IRA, then through NYSERDA, does it actually equal $8,000 or is it derated based on the tonnage installed? And then the third question would be is, is PSEG Long Island rebate additive or can you only choose one or the other? And then the last question is, for the heat pump rebate, does the heat pump need to be cold climate rated by the Northeast Energy Efficiency Partnership, otherwise known as NEEP? And those are my questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jason. Greatly appreciate you taking the time to provide those comments and those questions. And I sort of team appreciate it. Next, we will have Anna Turek. Anna, when you're ready. Good morning. My name is Anna Tarecki. I'm the residential sales manager for Mitsubishi Electric Train US. I have a few comments to make. One, uh, the first is regarding the continued kind of piling on to their contractors and what the requirements are to participate in the program. Uh, there was a comment earlier that was made earlier that um, there seems to be price increases that are associated or very similar to the, re the rebate amounts. I think a lot of that uh, happens because of the amount of uh, 
hours that a, a contractor is required to invest in any given job um, that's associated with the clean heat program. And it looks like even more so now with some of these requirements um, that are coming down the pipeline from the IRA. Uh, there is a significant amount of time and paperwork. I would like to see some of the the dollars that are earmarked for administrative costs to help contractors and alleviate some of the burden that falls on them to participate in these in these programs. The more contractors that you can get to participate in these programs, the more widespread and easier it will be for consumers to get these rebates. So that should be a consideration. Additionally, the training that is required to participate in these programs. Um, a lot of the training has already been done on the manufacturer level, and we ask that Clean Heat and ICERTA um, focus on utilizing those programs for any training requirements that come along with the program. And um, that would pretty much be most of my comments. So thank you, and I'll yield the remainder of the time. Thank you very much, Anna and greatly appreciate the patience of our participants and speakers here. You know, the queue is changing a little bit as some late entrants have joined, uh, but we'll make sure that everybody has their opportunity to speak. Uh, we would be Adam Flint and then Michael Hernandez. Uh, so Michael, you're on deck. Adam, please, when you're ready. Thanks very much for the opportunity to speak. Uh, my name is Adam Flint. I direct clean energy programs at Network for Sustainable Tomorrow, a small nonprofit in the southern tier of New York. Uh, my colleagues and I have served as contractors to NYSERDA for more than 10 years doing education and outreach ever since the days of Green Jobs Green New York. And I was personally a lead in designing the regional clean energy hub program. Um, I have two sets of comments, one having to do with program design and the other having to do with process of consultation with uh, community-based organizations. In terms of the first, um, our experience has been that Empower Plus and its previous, uh, its predecessor incentives were simply not adequate. And going forward, we wanna see programs err on the side of job completion, i.e. more generous incentives, simplification and flexibility for both customers and contractors alike, as opposed to NYSERDA's practice of spreading funds as thin and as far as possible with restrictive rules that exclude many buildings and owners from eligibility. There's a lot more that my colleagues and I have to say about all of this, but we really haven't been given the opportunities to do so. Um, we uh, have, in two instances been contacted to participate in consultations for climate justice CBOs in both instances in June and September. Inadequate notice was given, and so many of us have been unable to participate. Uh, in the case of EPA's Solar for All application, there was no attempt to consult with us at all, uh, despite very clear guidance about that from EPA and from support organizations like Clean Energy States Alliance. I'm requesting that Vice President DeRoches, Shyam Mehta, and Anthony Fiore act quickly to improve this process as time is very short. I've already met with Mr. Fiore regarding Solar for All. Uh, members of the Energy Justice Collaborative will be in touch about this matter. We would appreciate having the draft proposal for this particular um, solicitation that you're talking about right now made available ahead of the, 10, uh, the uh, December 20th deadline so that we can see where things are going, uh, because obviously there's no time at this point to have additional meetings. I'll end by saying that after working with LMI clients and home performance contractors for a great many years, more than a decade, we see many uh, jobs simply not going forward because of the rules and the incentives that have existed. This has created a negative impression of these programs in the market and also with contractors. We obviously need a great many more contractors, and I think we've already heard from several people the need to reduce the administrative burden on them as well. Thank you, and I yield the rest of my time. Thank you, Adam, for your comments. We appreciate it as usual. Thank you so much. Next, we'll have Michael, followed by Jay Best. Michael Hernandez, when you're ready. Hello, my name is uh, Michael Hernandez. I'm the New York Policy Director for Rewiring America. Uh, Rewiring America is a national nonprofit uh, really focused on the demand side 
of electrification. How can we help people move forward with their electrification journeys, providing people with incentives, information, and assistance. Um, we want to thank NYSERDA for this webinar today. Um, Suzanne and Courtney provided very clear and helpful information. We're, we appreciate that. Um, we support uh, leveraging the existing building electrification and energy efficiency incentives through stacking and braiding, uh, and that should definitely happen, um, <clears throat> including using the existing Empire Plus stacking uh, of, uh, system of stacking multiple funding sources, uh, particularly the, the $5 billion in funding authorized through the new efficiency New York between 2026 and 2030 uh, for building electrification and energy efficiency purposes. We also uh, support targeting disadvantaged communities and Justice 40 communities. Uh, they, that, uh, the rebate should be focused, uh, targeted on LMI households uh, and ensure equitable distribution. We support greater than 40% of incentives uh, going for low-income households, at least 50%. Uh, we think there should be a focus on incentives for delivered fuels. Um, uh, households, um, which uh, is particularly ones that don't contribute to the system benefit charge. These are new households that really get a bang for the buck. They will have cleaner homes, more affordable homes, and, and save a lot on their energy costs. Um, and then we would also encourage uh, Rewiring America's IRA calculator um, and collaboration with uh, market uh, participants and stakeholders in providing information and education uh, to the marketplace about these incentives. Um, and uh, we do support the contractor incentive uh, being targeted for disadvantaged community workforce development. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Michael. We'll now hear from Jay Best, followed by Richard Koss. Jay, when you're ready. All right, good morning. Uh, my name's Jay Best. I'm the Vice President of the Building Performance Contractors Association of New York, BPCA. BPCA is an organization that uh, really helps contractors navigate the programs and interacts with um, various utilities and including ICERTA considerably uh, to help refine the programs and, and make them work better for contractors. And I just want to emphasize the importance of that as we move forward. I'm also the CEO of Green Team Long Island, a home performance heat pump and electrification contract on Long Island, which specialize in residential energy efficiency. I want to give a shout out to NYSERDA for, uh, and especially Courtney Moriarty for this presentation. I found it very informative. Also want to acknowledge the importance of NYSERDA's past support for BPCA and what has been able to uh, help to build um, a contractor base on New York. Um, and as we look forward, you know, there's a mandate uh, as part of this to support con the contractor community. And so we certainly encourage NYSERDA to continue with support of BPCA to really give contractors a constructive way to provide com uh, comments, feedback, and uh, help the programs move forward. There's another um, issue out there that um, uh, while we're very excited about the IRA program, there is an unintended short-term impact that's causing some customers to delay installations for fear of missing out. And we've seen that even in some of the comments today in the Q&A that custom, you know, potential uh, homeowners, you know, or homeowners who are looking at potential projects wondering if they should wait. And so Department of Energy recently issued some guidance to states um, about uh, how to apply retroactive rebates for homeowners. And while we see a lot of issues with doing retroactive rebates, if it's something that's gonna be required, we think that if NYSERDA can provide some guidance in the short term um, so that uh, we know how to help homeowners um, uh, be set up to receive retroactive rebates, say starting like in, in 2024, then um, we can start to generate excitement and also sort of uh, address this issue of, you know, should I do the pro project now or should I wait? And we can, you know, we want to be able to honestly tell homeowners, hey, let's do this now. You'll still get any incentives that are going to come down the pike, um, you know, later in 2024 or even 2025. Um, you know, we, we want to build that excitement and make sure that, uh, that people take advantage of the programs. Thank you very much for your time. I'll yield. Thank you very much, Jay. Next, we're going to have Richard Koss, followed by Kevin Brenner. Richard, when you're ready. Richard. 
Richard, are you there, Richard? Here we go. Hello. Excellent. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, and good morning. Uh, my name is Richard Koss. I am the Chief Research Officer of Recursion, which is a leading data and analytics firm focused in the housing and uh, finance space. Uh, in this regard, we are a minority women-owned small business uh, registered as such uh, in this way. Uh, I've been very impressed as well with the quality of the presentation so far, and particularly the comments and the broad understanding that uh, dealing with complexity is going to be a key part of the success of this, um, uh, you know, of these efforts. Uh, we have a significant amount of experience in terms of policy analysis in the housing space, dealing with requirements such as income uh, for various programs and this sort of thing. Uh, but we also have experience with um, building systems for the disposition of assets for HUD that involves uh, making sure that there is clear and clean communication uh, between people who enter information into these systems and the consumers of it. Uh, uh, and, you know, so, in, you know, this is just absolutely key in terms of what I thought, particularly the first commenter say, in terms of avoiding chaos here, uh, that we're dealing with many different stakeholders and we need to be clear that communication is key, is clear. And we also need to be sure that within uh, the overall governance of the program, that with NYSERDA, that if there are issues to be resolved in terms of areas of responsibility and the availability of data and information across different stakeholders, that these, these can be resolved quickly and efficiently uh, in order to forestall any delays in, uh, uh, in in the implementation of these programs. One other very quick comment is we've done the agencies, the Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, Ginny Mae, and probably some of the state agencies are increasingly coming up with programs that give preferences of some kind or other to loans or multifamily mortgages that meet criteria associated with, um, uh, uh, with environmental uh, considerations. And by pooling these and giving them guarantees, lower costs in terms of uh, borrowing for individual uh, homeowners and also for uh, larger institutions with uh, multifamily buildings is available uh, you know, to be generated as well. So there are a lot of potential uh, consequences here um, in this side. So I just want to conclude with a brief uh, uh, comment that I think that the success of these programs is going to be a combination of leveraging technology, particularly cutting edge uh, information, you know, or technologies associated with dealing with large amounts of information, and also bringing in all of the excellent and deep expertise of the market participants that, you know, that everybody feels like what they think, think is an important consideration uh, for participation this program is taken into account, but that the systems involved make it transparent for the stakeholders to participate uh, in the programs. Thank you very much for uh, your time. Thank you very much, Richard. Uh, next will be Kevin Brenner, and on deck is James Hartford. Kevin, when you are ready. About that, can you? Uh, I'm going to yield my time. Understood. Thank you very much, Kevin. Appreciate you taking the time. James, you are next. Hi. Thanks for having us, um, and um, I appreciate the chance to talk. Um, James Hartford. I'm an architect and certified passive house consultant working in the Hudson Valley. Um, and my firm is an MWBE firm. Um, and um, I'm also. Uh, uh, speaking in the capacity as uh, uh, the uh, board member of the um, Passive House Alliance in New York State. Um, it uh, is very important to us both professionally in our firm and um, as in, uh, the professional organization and Passive House um, that we see more support for training um, professionals, whether they're architects, designers, or raters, 
because we need to uh, solve design, um, solve the energy uh, challenge as a design problem so that we're reducing um, energy as um, much energy demand as much as possible so that we can reasonably meet the um, the energy loads in electrification. So I encourage that uh, NYSERDA um, in its job training also offer um, training to uh, passive house professionals um, um, and not just for tradespeople. Um, it's uh, very important that um, that the professionals get that support and I can't assume that everyone in in a white collar job has the uh, means to do so. Thank you. Thank you very much, James. Appreciate your comments. Next, we are going to have Andrea with Colleen on deck. So, Andrea, please, when you're ready. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'd like to um, thank Mary Ann Rothman um, from the Council for New York Co-ops and Condos for communicating and educating uh, multifamily buildings like mine. Um, I represent a 1939 building in the Kingsbridge Riverdale area of the Bronx. I'm a board president of a seven member volunteer board serving a 54 unit building. Um, our area medium income is unknown to me at this present time. Um, my purpose for joining this is because technically to meet any further reductions in our energy use and savings in this 54 unit building to meet local law 97 requirements and to avoid financial penalties. We, we have to make further electrical upgrades to our building that could cost anywhere from 1 and a half million to 2 million dollars because 1939 building. Um, any incentive um, that our co-op can achieve is going to bring us closer to the goals of our energy reduction and savings. Um, but our existing reserve funds in our 54 unit building are not going to cover any further energy saving measures to help with the improvement of, um, of energy savings. Um, the incentives for the electrical service upgrade of $4,000 and the electrical wiring upgrade, which I'm hoping would be per unit of a building, um, is not is going to be a very helpful piece, but but not close to the two million dollars. So I just like to appreciate that your um, your communication to people like me comes through organizations like CNYC, um, using however journalists you can use for the Cooperator magazine reaching out to managing agents of multifamily buildings as directly as possible through their governing organizations to ultimately help the bottom end provider or user of energy, the, the inhabitants of multifamily buildings to be successful in achieving these, the, the climate goals and the energy saving goals that we have. Um, thank you and I yield my time. Thank you very much and perfect timing there. <laughs> Much appreciated. Next, we are going to have Colleen and then Valerie. Colleen, when you are ready. And while Colleen is getting ready, uh, just a reminder to everybody that has been asking, there will be a recording along with the presentation that will be provided and all comments written and verbal will be reviewed by the NYSERDA team. And we will be providing again the information on the email account where you can send your comments. Colleen, if you are ready. Hello, I'm Colleen Thornton. Um, I have a, a question um, that um, uh, you've all been giving um, great information and um, you've um, been speaking very clearly and I appreciate that. Um, I live within a, a small village in the middle of the Adirondacks of about 4,000 people. I live within the village limits. Um, uh, I live in a single family, um, uh, four bedroom brick home by myself. Um, on my property, I have um, you know, a, a wood garage, one car, which is, is fine. Um, my question is about um, um, a barn that is on my property and um it's a um i live on approximately a little over an acre of land um and the the barn is um is pre-1935 it's a two-story uh wood clapboard barn um it's um it's 
unoccupied other than some storage uh, uh, that I have in there of uh, my personal uh, effects. Um, my question is, is there, is there any um, funding for um, improvements on the barn or, or, and or electric electrification of the barn or, or heating of the barn? Um, uh, either you know inside or our outside and um so um that's that's my question thank, thank you. you so much colleen we really appreciate you taking the time to pose a question our Minnesota colleagues will be reviewing all questions posed here and we'll be reviewing and seeking to provide response and we greatly appreciate your time next we'll have valerie followed by dennis Valerie, two minutes when you are ready. Valerie, are we ready to go? Looks like Valerie might need a moment here. So what we'll do is we'll have Dennis go next and then we'll put Valerie back in the queue. Dennis, are you with us and ready? Uh oh, looking like we might be having some technical issues here. We'll hold on Valerie and Dennis. Sure enough. Oh, Valerie says they have yielded their time. Thank you for noting that, Valerie. Dennis, are you here? Okay. And then we'll be moving on to Jenna. Jenna Wilson, please. Thank you. Oops. I think I can speak now. Okay. Yes, you can. You Great, thank you, you so you much. much. Um, my name is Jenna Lawson. I am the Clean Energy Hub Director for the Climate Solutions Accelerator of the Genesee Finger Lakes region. So I serve as NYSERDA's uh, Clean Energy Hub in the Finger Lakes. So first starting there, I would really love the hubs. Uh, we've been kind of positioned as the front line of communicating and, and serving through energy advisors, uh, both residents and small businesses. Uh, with a special focus on disadvantaged communities. So I'd love to see us purposefully integrated into the rollout of the IRA programs. Um, I just a couple of comments. Uh, one is the timeline has shifted a lot and I totally understand, especially really appreciating how long that list and that last slide was. Um, but if there's any way that like four months out or something like that, it could really be locked in both for public knowledge that it's going to be rolling out on a certain day and for uh, your partner organizations that are in charge of presenting it and educating the public on it and driving them towards contractors who can actually help them take advantage of these rebates. That is really key to this not being just something that the savviest folks who have the most time to research and are ready, you know, as soon as the gun fires to get these rebates uh, have access to them. The second is that there really needs to be an expedited process for emergencies if you're going to serve the LMI community equitably. As I think Francois said, a lot of these, uh, especially mechanical upgrades or equipment changes for LMI folks happen when there's a no heat emergency, there's no hot water on a certain day. And a lot of times we find that they are driven towards just replacing with a high efficiency gas furnace instead of going for a heat pump or heat pump hot water heater because the, the time is simply too onerous, especially in our New York winters, for them to try to wait and also finance and get the grant support that they need. Um, another thing is if you could just really think about this energy savings modeling tool. Um, the Green Jobs Green New York tool, the math that it's based on, we uh, did an energy study through Green Jobs Green New York for a church that showed that if they wanted to get a ground source heat pump, there would be a payback period of 500 years. So if the 20% energy savings are going to be based on similar math, you're going to find that people don't have the, the ability to calculate that savings. 
Uh, and finally, uh, multifamily for 50% of units must qualify. I would go back to, I forget who it was, but whoever said allowing people to attest to being low income or income qualifying, or even going based on the location of the multifamily building or the rent charged is going to be really key to making sure that the multifamily money doesn't just go to places that are Section 8 designated or affordable housing projects. Uh, there's a lot of naturally occurring affordable housing that will not be able to access if the standard is that they need to prove the income sensitive information of all of their residents. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jenna. Really appreciate you taking the time to provide public comment this morning. Uh, Dennis, are we good to go here? Not hearing anything from our colleague Dennis, we'll move on. It will be Michael Gervasi, followed by Eric. Uh, Michael Gervasi, are you ready to go? I think we'll move on to Eric then. Eric, please. Greetings, everyone. This is Eric Dubin. I'm the senior director at Mitsubishi Electric, and um, I appreciate the opportunity to uh, to have some uh, comments here. Um, first of all, um, on the training side, we'd like to see NYSERDA sort of consider using um, manufacturers training. It's already been built out with extreme expertise. Um, we don't want to see 50 different programs representing every state. It, it would be inefficient. So if there's a possibility to um, to leverage and jump on on onto the existing programs, um, we, we highly recommend that. Um, we're two hundred million dollars spread spread across the United States is really not enough money to get all the training out that we need. So um, you know we we want to leverage that that training. Um, the second uh, point here is um, it's it's critical to to keep manufacturers such as ourselves informed of where um, policies are going and trying to to inform them um, as 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 far out on on the value chain as possible um, it takes a long time months and months to order deliver and of course um, we're going through uh, refrigerant changes right now as well as um, uh, um, testing procedure training changes so um, early and critical to keep them informed um, we want to, a couple of very important points. First of all, we want to make sure that we're paying the contractors in this midstream program quickly. Uh, contractors cannot float the increased rebate dollar amounts that are going to be associated with um, these programs. So critical to pay them as quickly as possible. And finally, um, as, as someone just said, emergencies happen and they're always happen um, at the worst time of the year. Uh, either too hot or too, you know, extremely cold. Um, we would like to see, um, you know, when emergencies happen, they technically, they always go back with their, or a lot of times they go back with their existing components. We'd like to see the creation of, of some sort of early retirement incentives to encourage um, people to, to, uh, to um, take advantage of these programs to replace their systems before there's a puddle on the ground. And of course, who wouldn't love an early retirement? Um, thank you very much, and I yield my time. Thank you, Eric. Michael Belter, are you here? Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, yeah, I think everybody raised a lot of good points. Um, I definitely would like to reiterate um, at the point of sale or point of insulation, um, and as uh, instantaneous as the process could be, um, that would be helpful. Um, if we can't get self, um, assertions of income, if there's a way, um, for that to be verified by an outside, um, source, um, so, um, especially multifamily buildings, people aren't, um, having to, uh, chase after everybody for their individual income requirements and, um, for, um, the trainings, if there were, uh, if we can make it very clear what the different um, entities that can apply for the trainings and the, the tracks 
and really like what the trainings are supposed to focus on in terms of skills, like really clearly listed out. Um, so we're not having to have to kind of like make these programs on our own and then get them reviewed. We can kind of do more plug and play. And then I just wanted to understand um, for the HERE program, no, the ATR program, it was up to 100 units in a multifamily building if I did the math right. Um, so that was that was all I had. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. And next in line, another Michael, Michael Bennett, when you're ready. Hi, good morning. My name is Michael Bennett. I'm the senior manager of construction operations at Sealed. Sealed is a climate tech company with a mission to stop energy waste and electrify all homes. We are currently an aggregator in energy efficiency programs, and we provide software and solutions to help contractors take advantage of rebate programs. Sealed was founded in New York, and I'm also based in New York. In my position and previous positions in the HVAC space, I've had the opportunity to work directly with contractor partners in the state. And as a result, I have a unique understanding of all the challenges that contractors face when accessing these rebate programs. When setting up the IRA rebate, IRA rebate programs, I very much encourage NYSERDA to focus on simplifying the contractor experience and listening to contractors such as the Building Performance Contractor Association of New York State. If these programs are too complicated, contractors will simply not participate. I encourage NYSERDA to also include the measured pathway when designing the IRA efficiency rebate program. I have seen how measured savings works on the ground and the wide ranging benefits that it can provide to contractors and households. In particular, the measured pathway ensures equitable program outcomes while almost always providing higher rebates, especially for low income households. It protects consumers and taxpayers from waste and fraud and it assists with grid reliability issues such as Grid operators requiring both demand side and supply side resources to be both measured and verified. And also it simplifies the program experience for contractors and homeowners. For example, SEALD is an aggregator currently in the California based measured savings program, and it's providing accountability and high energy savings to households while also simplifying the contractors experience within those programs. In the IRA rebate programs, aggregators, which are the market actors that streamline energy efficiency programs, we can help contractors in New York reduce costs while also creating program simplicity that will unlock market transformation. Truly a win-win for all involved. I uh, really appreciate the opportunity to speak today and I look forward to, to working with you directly to implement these critical programs. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. Rebecca Poole, two minutes when you're ready. I'd like to see if my time. No problem at all. Now let's see if our Dennis, are you here? Okay. Not hearing Dennis. Lord Travers, you will be next. Two minutes on the clock for you when you are ready, followed by Jen Metzger. Hi. Um, can you hear me? Huh? Yes, we can. I'm, uh... Thank you. Um, living in a co-op in uh, New York City, so it's a thousand and, and, and seven hundred unit uh, large co-op. And I like what, what seems to me is that first of all, there should be a really big differentiation about which money is available to the co-op as a whole. Um, should should it implement some um, energy savings uh, measures and what is available to um, individual shareholders uh, to you know possibly um, also retrofit their own apartments? So, like to make a, a clear differentiation between how uh, um, the whole residents can apply for funds and how the individual shareholder can apply for, for funds and, and clarification about the income limits, the 50%. What's the AMI? Is that the uh, AMI by the census or is it the AMI by um, uh, HUD? These are my comments. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And we will hear from Jen Metzger now. Hi, 
Thanks so much for the opportunity to comment. Um, I'm Ulster County Executive, and uh, I have really prioritized creating models for how to reach uh, our climate goals under the CLCPA. Um, I wanted uh, I wanted to just um, bring to your attention that counties have very unique opportunities and advantages uh, when it comes to connecting with low income households since we administer programs like HEAP, SNAP, Medicaid. Um, and uh, I would really like to see us be able to take advantage of those connections to uh, uh, to get, you know, to get the, our low income households in Ulster County to be able to take advantage of, of all of the incentives under the IRA and through NYSERDA. Um, we uh, have created a new position within our Department of Social Services to focus on this. But there, I just wanna make you aware that there are challenges because of uh, state rules around those programs um, in, really, in really utilizing that um, you know, unique uh, advantage in re reaching these households. And I hope that uh, NYSERDA will um, you know, work with the relevant state agencies because there are huge missed opportunities um, by having, you know, these uh, departments focused, um, you know, 100% on trying to help low-income households and are not participating in, um, you know, getting uh, clean energy assistance to them. So uh, just want to put that on your radar and hope we can work together on that. I also want to just um, make, uh, put out there that it would be important for these rebates to apply uh, to emergency and supportive housing as well. These are buildings that definitely could use those, uh, the improvements. Uh, and finally, I chair the Climate Action Committee for the New York State Association of Counties, and uh, we passed a resolution unanimously really calling for an uh, you know, expedited um, rollout of, these, of the rebate program. I know it's a very complicated application process, uh, a, a federal application process, but New York, I think, is uniquely uh, um, able to meet the challenge because of our um, of our really great uh, program. So I'm hoping that you'll take advantage of the accelerated application, and uh, we can get these rebates out to our households. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jen. And given the time and our ability to clear our queue, that ends our public comment opportunity here. We thank you so much for all of the fantastic comments that we heard verbally today. And to remind you, this is not the last time where there is an opportunity to comment and to be heard. We are very excited to continue receiving feedback whether a spoken comment or is in any of the upcoming stakeholder engagement opportunities, such as that Courtney mentioned, along with a variety of different opportunities to provide public comment. So a couple of items here to flag. First, if you'd like to continue staying engaged and informed about what is happening, there are a variety of different places on both New York State's website, the DOE's web pages, and the IRS's web pages where you can find information related to guidance on the Inflation Reduction Act, the Home Energy Rebate Programs, the guidance on tax credits and deductions that the IRS have already provided, along with details of the contractor training grants, which will be used to help to support the implementation of the HER and HERE programs. Our NYSERDA Residential Market Advisory Group is one of the best forums that you can use to stay engaged with the single family residential team. That group hosts quarterly meetings and also small subgroup processes to advance your interests and make sure that NYSERDA's programming reflects the interests and perspectives of the market at hand. And last, but certainly not least, for all those who wanted to be able to say more, may not have had the opportunity to provide public comment now, or are seeking a venue to be able to make sure their voice is heard in this process, it is integral that you use the residential.ira at nyserta.ny.gov email account to send all written comments. 
all comments received by 4 p.m. Eastern time on Wednesday, December 20th will be included in NYSERDA's input and will help to make an impact on the proposed plan for these programs. So a reminder, this is not the last opportunity. In fact, this should be a great jumping off point for us to be able to use the fantastic information shared today to make sure that we're building shared awareness and helping to really get into the problem sets that many of you helped to share with us today. Can't express enough our sincere thank you to all of those who participated today. It was very important effort. As we saw, there was a huge amount of interest in this. We will continue to be listening and absorbing as you look to develop these programs into the future with you. With that, I think I will call it here for the team on behalf of the NYSERDA Clean and Resilient Buildings and all of us here in New York State and my team at Kearns and West, we thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us and hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. We'll be in touch soon. Be well.